Hi, everyone. Welcome to the At Hearts to Mom podcast. I'm Lauren Rose, and today we're talking to Janice Eisman. Janice is a compassionate inquiry practitioner and movement specialist who is focused on helping you integrate mind and body to reduce pain and live your best life. Welcome, Janice. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, because we're going to be talking about some trauma modalities. Um, So just let us know a little bit about you. Yeah, so as you already mentioned, I am a movement specialist, and I'm also trained in three different trauma modalities. Those link together because a lot of people who have pain in their body also have trauma backgrounds. So I noticed years ago, I have a one-to-one client practice, so what that really means is I'm working privately with people. As we start to release and do therapeutics on the areas of pain that people have in their body. So that could be the knee, the back, the shoulder, the neck, the jaw, you name it. I've seen it all. I noticed that people would start to open up and share different traumatic pieces of their background. So that could be a car accident. It could be a sports injury, it, but it also could be something from their childhood that commonly comes up. It could be a, a sexual assault history, etc. So I wasn't too sure at that time when I opened my practice uh, what I should do about this because it kind of took me aside. It took me aback that people were kind of sharing all of this. Now, in the history of trauma modalities, that was 17 years ago. So that is like a whole other lifetime. So I think that today most of us could understand and we, we know the link between trauma and the body. But 17 years ago... I had to dig and research and really look into, you know, what is this? Why are people experiencing this? Why are people telling me this? And I was a, I am a very curious person. So I started reading and figuring out what practitioners and what modalities and who was doing this kind of work. So I, I ended up training with kind of our top big three now. So I have training with the trauma center, which is Bessel van der Kolk. I have training with Gabor Maté and I'm currently enrolled in a training with Peter Levine. And those three practitioners are really taking mind first and adding the body, but they are the closest to the work that I really wanted to integrate into my work. So in my studio space, I'm doing physical modalities. So I'm doing things like Pilates and yoga and Yamada body rolling and critical alignment therapy with people who have pain. And then I'm infusing and layering over top those trauma modalities when and where it's appropriate. Yeah, I'm really interested in trauma. Um, My podcast is for people with chronic pain, but I believe there's definitely often a link between trauma and chronic pain. So that's why I'm just so interested in talking about trauma once in a while. What are some known physical manifestations that of of trauma that are, that are clinically recognized? So I do want to just start by saying that not all pain and not all chronic pain is caused by trauma. So that's super important because I think if we start clinically treating something that doesn't exist, that's not the right treatment. So when we're looking at treatment modalities, we want to make sure first that the person has trauma in their background. Now, to be fair, most people actually do. But trauma really is not about the event that happened. It's about how we actually process it or we don't process it. So it often really ties into what kind of supports we had, what other levels of trauma that we have. So once we kind of recognize that that is there, then that can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. So one of the top ways is that the pain receptors are actually overactive. So we may see something like a fibromyalgia. We may see chronic digestive issues. The digestive system is particularly sensitive. It's also heavily linked to the brain. And that's an area where a lot of people shut down, especially when we have a sexual trauma history. So that may be your IBS, constipation, things like that. So I see a lot of that. And even without knowing anything about trauma per se, most of us can really relate to when we are afraid, we might feel those butterflies in the belly. So sometimes when we have anxiety, we feel fluttering in our stomach. The other thing that 
can really happen is a lot of tightness and tension through the upper body. So that's an area, again, where people instinctively understand when we feel fear, when we feel tension, the shoulders often kind of pop up into the ears. So we might see anything from a postural shift to chronic upper or lower back pain, a lot of neck pain, clenching of the jaw. And then finally, I often will see it actually in the glutes. So again, we kind of even have languaging for this in our society. We call something that's an irritant, a pain in the ass. <laughs> so we yeah. know that there's a lot of tension and protection in that area of the body. Most of the time, we're more aware of feeling things. And again, this is a generality, but from kind of the neck down to the pubic bone in the front of the body. But when we see things like sciatica, again, your fibromyalgia, things like that, those could have a root in trauma. Yeah, absolutely. What are some examples of modalities that can help with trauma? Almost anything where we're integrating the mind and the body. So that is very general. Um, if you have ever read Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, he actually talks about a lot of different modalities, everything from movement therapies to artistic therapies. So that could be creativity, art, music. I do photography, anything like that, that is going to be a link between the body's movement and the brain helps integrate the body. I use movement modalities to do it. So I'm using, I listed some of these off already, but I'm using trauma sensitive yoga. I'm using Yamana body rolling, which isn't specifically a trauma therapy, but what we're doing is doing an exercise. Then I have the person lay on the mat, discuss what they're feeling in their body, share what I'm observing is happening in their body. And that really brings the person into the present moment. So one of the keys to trauma processing and integrating is being in the present moment. So it's when our mind is not racing ahead to thinking about what we're doing this afternoon. It's also not somewhere back behind us. So the more we can get into the present of what is the experience right now, and that's part of where things like art therapy or music come into play, because you can't draw or take a picture of something and also be thinking about something that happened 20 years ago. So what that tends to do is move us along the chain of development, because what happens with trauma, especially when it is in, in those younger years, is some of the development of the nervous system and some of the integration of the mind and the body may not actually happen. And that's where we pick up some of those coping techniques, uh, including postural and physical coping techniques. But coping techniques could be shopping too much, checking out by gossiping. It could be actual addictions, things like that. So moving ourselves into that present moment experience. Of course, there is a trauma sensitive mindfulness or meditation practice that people can do. So it really runs the gamut. And I mention that because I do one modality, but there's certainly others. So it, you know, there's not kind of just one way to process trauma or to close that stress cycle in the body, which is actually really helpful because it's really about finding that technique that speaks to you where you're like, ah, I could be in my present moment body right now doing this technique. Yeah. And I remember from the body keeps the score that you know, what trauma does is dampen the connection between the amygdala, which is our like fire alarm or smoke detector and our prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking brain. And so there's, that puts us in just a constant state of fight or flight. And so I guess this, these mindfulness techniques, the being in the here and now kind of contradicts or, or you know what I mean? It does. It gives what I call, it gives the body a different blueprint. So particularly yeah. if that trauma happened when we were children, often that's just our state of being. We don't know any other way. That's just how we are. And we think that's how everybody else experiences everything. So one small incident, if somebody 
walking towards you at a store or somebody saying something to you can set off what is called a trigger, which is where you have that kind of that full body response. You have an automatic response to something and it may have no correlation to what's happening in the here and now. So that's where we really can start to develop that understanding that we have trauma in the body is when something is happening in our adult life where we're responding in a way that is not correlated to what's actually happening. Hmm. What do these trauma modalities do? And I mean, how do they work to, to, to release some of the trauma? There's a lot of different ways I could answer that. One is actually what you just mentioned. So it's, it's linking those pieces of the brain so that the information in the brain and the nervous system is correlated and connected. So again, if we, if we have an interruption to that, especially when we're younger, the brain sort of shifts around it. So one of the cool things about, uh, about humans is that we adapt to every environment. So we adapt to different climates, we adapt to different geographies, we adapt to different food. And it's why people can have such wide range diets or activities or lifestyles. And we can live literally anywhere on the planet and eat anything and do anything and be in all these different climates. But our bodies actually adapt to the environment where we grow up. So we are adapting to the kind of parenting that we're given. We're adapting to the culture around us. We're adapting to the other kids at school and to the activities that we're doing. And our body and our brains kind of assume this is the, this is how it's going to be. Well, most of us in the modern world don't actually have that experience. We grow up and we move out from our parents and we don't often have, you know, day-to-day -day encounters with people we went to elementary school with, et cetera. So our body has adapted around an environment that we're actually no longer in. So these modalities are going to help create more openness and more space and more integration to have different responses to the same stimuli. So it makes sense that, you know, if we take another animal, like a dog, that every time a woman approaches that dog, if the dog gets beaten, that the dog's going to start to have a reaction to a woman, but we're no different. So we often think of ourselves as these very rational beings that are not animals but we're animals. So, you know, that's a very simplified example, but a lot of us actually have those kinds of responses. So, you know, whether it's somebody's body language, tone of voice, how their tone changes, we're very responsive to nonverbal cues of people and things around us. So it's going to create a change in how we automatically response, respond to things. Another thing that it does Many of us have had the experience where when we grew up, we were just told whatever you're feeling is either wrong or it doesn't exist or it's not like that or you're exaggerating. And so we actually often have a response inside ourselves of shame, blame, fear, suppression, things like that. So a trauma modality is going to allow for some expression of an experience that may not be positive and it's met with compassion. And that compassion allows expression of authenticity where we don't have to change or modify or be different. We can just express it without having our whole body kind of say, oh, we have to hide this, we have to repress, we have to suppress because that's where we actually know clinically that we get a lot of different health problems. So between pain or heart disease or, you know, different um, inflammatory diseases, that suppression of emotion has a lot of negative consequences long-term. So in a trauma modality, we're able to actually go back to a different age or a different stage or a different time in life. And we're able to kind of reprogram the thinking. And that isn't done by saying, let's reprogram the thinking. It's just done by allowing a little bit of that emotion to come out, a little bit of that expression to come out in a safe container and have it met with, that's normal. That's what all people do. 
you know, can you have compassion for that within yourself? And that actually changes the entire body. It changes the body chemistry. It changes the experience of how we get to live as humans. Yeah, according to the book by Dr. Mel Pohl, A Day Without Pain, up to 80% of our physical pain is from suppressed emotional pain. And I started learning that when I was in a four-week inpatient pain recovery program back in 2015. And I just started realizing how a lot of my suppressed trauma and my suppressed emotions might be manifesting as my physical pain. And I just thought it was so interesting. Yeah, and there's interesting studies and statistics on how few confidence the average adult in the U.S. has. So the average adult in America, especially if they're male, has very few people to talk to. They they don't have a huge network typically of people to actually be really authentic and share that emotional experience with. Our culture just doesn't really have as much of that as we could or perhaps should. So I think that most of us are walking around in some sort of state of suppression a lot of the time because it's embedded into our culture. If you think about going into an office, it's a very common question to say, hello, how are you? And the answer is actually kind of pre-written. Great, how are you doing? And then really a focus on the positive. We would find it culturally odd and oversharing and needy and other negative words if the person was actually to say, you know, I'm doing okay, but I'm a bit sad this morning because my marriage is filled with a bit of grief. You know, we just, we don't take that to the office. We don't take that to our kids' sports games. We keep that inside. And then we share that with usually paid clinicians. So it's often just therapists who hear that. Women have slightly more confidants, but even then there's often kind of that cultural overlay of what is acceptable to talk about and what's not acceptable to talk about. And if we have a background where as kids, we were told to not have those thoughts or feelings or emotions or not express them or that we were over dramatizing them. There's often that inbound fear of getting judged or that we're wrong, et cetera. So we just have a cultural overlay of emotional suppression because our culture focuses on ration as opposed to emotion. At the end of the day though, we're animals. So we are more, we are, emotional beings with the capacity for ration as opposed to we are rational beings with the capacity for emotion. Yeah, that makes sense. And I imagine that a lot of people with trauma don't seek traditional therapy because, you know, in CBT, you're, you're talking about exactly what happened. And I know that's one of the reasons that I didn't seek therapy for 20 years, because I didn't want to go back and rehash all of that stuff that had happened. I just wanted it to be over and done with. So I love that these modalities that you're talking about don't require you to go and talk about all the details of everything that happened. No, actually a lot of the trauma work that I'm doing, we don't ever have to discuss anything. The body is getting a lot of new information and education without actually talking about it at all. So that's actually one of the things that I think is miraculous about trauma work is that you can have a verbal component, but it can actually be entirely somatic as well. Yeah, I think that's really cool. And I I think maybe people listening who haven't done any trauma work that might really resonate with them and and maybe encourage them to to try something. Yeah, and I, I have a book called Traumatic Stress and it's written by Bessel van der Kolk and it's for clinicians and it, it may be of interest to you that the average person in now this was a study of world war ii veterans which is kind of the first cohort that was known to have trauma so what we ended up calling trauma later was called shell shock when the 
World War II veterans came home and there was an awareness that there was this group of people that was having kind of a common set of symptoms. So there may be slightly more modernized information, but at the time of the publishing of that book, that was the largest cohort of trauma survivors that was ever known and they could study them, which is amazing. So I thought it was very, very interesting that the average veteran took 20 years to actually process their stress. Now, there was a lot of kind of different reasons why, one of which was that these folks tended to be a bit on the younger side when they returned home from war. And then when they got into middle age, there's all these different stressors on the body, financial, marital stress, family stress, work stress, all of the stressors that we know that adding those on just meant suddenly that those traumatic stresses became too much to bear. But I think that that's actually such an important thing for people to be aware of, because we often think, well, that, that trauma just happened. You, you process it and then you're done with it. That's not really what happens. So it does take people on average two decades to actually to start working with it. So I like to mention that because I think that sometimes we think, well, it's too late or something's wrong with me or other people have managed this or I should be done with this. It was last year, but that's not necessarily how it works. Now, within that, if you feel called to process your trauma sooner than 20 years, I encourage you to do that too. But if, if you are currently, let's say 45, and you haven't dealt with your trauma, it is not too late. You're, you're right on schedule. That's really common. So it's not, it's not too late. It's when things become interesting to you and you feel like you have a bit of capacity to make those changes in your life. So what should somebody who has chronic pain and trauma do when they realize, oh, I haven't processed my trauma? Like what would be the first step? So I like to actually work with the body first. It tends to be, in my experience, a bit of an easier jump point. So all of us have parts of us that are going to come in as protectors. So if I just met somebody off the street and they wanted to start probing my childhood trauma, I probably would just kind of shut down and maybe not go there. We all have that. So even if somebody has decided, okay, I'm going to process my trauma, I'm going to go to a therapist, I think a lot of your listeners can probably even relate to this, kind of get into the session, the therapist is going to push a little bit and maybe pull back a little bit and push a little bit, but there may come to a place in that session where you're just like, nope, I'm not doing this, Uh, this is too much for me, shut down. So we all have that natural stop point and it's going to be a little bit different for different people. So there are people for whom just getting in there for five minutes, is going to be that stop point. Other people might, you know, they're, they're comfortable for a full hour. So I find that if I work with the body, we can introduce that a lot more gently. So we can be doing some of that body work and we can be opening the body and we can be relieving that pain and we can be doing that physical work. And then we can add whatever the person is comfortable with. So I do have people that that is five minutes and that's okay because five minutes is going to get us started. And then we're going to get that presence And we're going to get that vocabulary of the body and the body awareness. We're going to get the body moving. Uh, There are actual nervous system fascia impacts on the body with the work that we're doing. That is me as a practitioner. And obviously every modality and every practitioner might give you a slightly different answer. But I think it's really kind of finding a practitioner or modality or something that you just feel a little bit curious about, like, oh, I wouldn't mind trying that and going there. And obviously I would recommend looking for somebody who is actually trauma certified in some way, because there are a lot of trauma sensitive programs right now that are not trauma certifications. So they kind of explain, because trauma became a little bit for lack of a better word, a little bit trendy in the last few years. So a lot of practitioners want to learn about it. 
So they take like a 20 hour course and there's nothing wrong with that. It kind of gives a broad overview, but that's going to be very different than somebody who has a trauma specialty who actually is fully trained in it. So I would just recommend that you kind of look into the background of the practitioner. So someone like myself has, you know, I have multiple trauma certifications, but I'm, I'm using the body and those movement modalities but then there's gonna be other people that are coming in from that therapy door or maybe the art door or there's music door. There's a lot of different kind of doorways. So just, I don't think that there's a right way or a wrong way or a better way or a worse way. It's just starting by dipping your toe in with a practitioner who's got one of those trauma certifications and starting to work with it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, just get started, take the next right step, just do something because otherwise it's just going to live in your body. That's right. And not, not every modality is going to be the right choice for every person. I've tried a couple of them that, that I didn't prefer. I know that before we started this recording, you and I had a conversation, you are doing some EMDR and I tried it and it was not my thing. I found it actually quite triggering. So that just, that just shows you that there's a lot of different kind of tools and techniques and practitioners and different things that for some people really are effective. And then for other people, maybe not. So that's the other really key piece is that if you try something and you're like, whoa, that was not for me, that doesn't mean that you are trauma treatment proof it doesn't mean that there isn't a modality out there that isn't going to speak to you and work for you no that's a really good point because everybody is so different and we respond differently to different treatments yeah and some of them are are a little bit more diffused and some of them are quite intense and so again it, it is different. It's how your nervous system is processing the work. And that's really the key is it's, it ultimately it's about our nervous system and it's about a nervous system that modulates our response to the situation that we're in. And if our nervous system gets cranked up by a specific modality, that doesn't mean something's wrong. It just might mean that that is, you need a bit more of a diffuse technique to work with to start. That's interesting to think about because I, I also find EMDR very intense and, um, but I mean, it, it's been working. I think it, it, I had, I, I saw something that was traumatic for me on video a few years ago and within just a couple of sessions of EMDR, my anxiety level, my panic level was down significantly. So that's why I keep doing it. I think that that's a really interesting point too, because I think whatever drives us to do that trauma work is something that's not working in our life. So that could be an addiction. It could be how we're relating to other people. It could be that we notice that we're having that kind of really elevated response to something, but it depends a bit on what it is. So I know after I did my compassion inquiry training, it took me really a year after the training finished, because as practitioners in training, we, I mean, I did a hundred sessions of the work itself. So you're, you're actually in there doing the work, which is great, but it took me a full year, if not two, to actually step back and be like, wow, the way that I'm responding to situations and people is different. So it takes time to integrate it. So if what you're having is a PTSD response, maybe EMDR for you, that can create that immediacy. For me, it was really rooted in my own acceptance of my emotions and my responses. And I could get really disturbed by other people and then ruminate and spend hours and days kind of ruminating and trying to figure out their psychology, et cetera. And that was one of my coping strategies from, from a very young period of life because I felt it was very subconscious, but if I could kind of get ahead of what that person was going to do strategically, I could be safe. So it could hijack my life. And that's a lot more of a subtle response than a PTSD response where you're like, <gasps> and having that kind of really big response. So it took me quite some time to sort of 
move through cycles of happenings and events and circumstances to actually fully integrate that and then and then realize like I'm having totally different reactions. I can look at things and experience things and not be in that spiral where I'm, you know, ruminating and overthinking and having that coping strategy arise again and again. So I think it also depends a little bit on what trauma response you're having actually. Mm -hmm. Right. So is there anything about trauma or modalities that we haven't covered before we wrap up that you wanted to make sure people knew about? I think the word trauma is often really misunderstood. Um, I did reference this earlier, but trauma is not about what happened. It's about how we're responding to it. And quite often our childhoods actually include trauma. So we can have had a great family, a really positive childhood experience and still have that developmental trauma. So I think for some people, there's a whole set of people who really relate to the word trauma. And there's another set of people that don't relate to it, but very much have trauma responses. So what I would encourage if that word feels upsetting to you is looking into a couple of different practitioners. Gabor Mate is one. Um, Judith Herman is another who actually speak about relational trauma. So that kind of old school Peter Levine and even to some extent Bessel van der Kolk def definition of it often is related to an incident. It's a car accident. It is, uh, it's a sexual assault or another trauma that you can pinpoint. This is what happened on this day. But in the 1990s, there was another definition. And of course it was a woman who, who brought this forward, Judith Herman, that said, hey, you know, like our relationships can cause trauma and it's relationally that we get out of it. And so that matters a lot because first of all, it takes it away from the idea that it was a thing that happened and it can be a whole period of your life. And second, it is the relationship. So I think that is worth saying over and over again, because many people in our kind of self-help culture believe that we can fix everything ourselves. If we just get the knowledge and we just get the tools, we can go execute the thing. But if you have relational trauma, you need relationship to fix it. We're not gonna do that sitting alone, sitting on a couch. We actually need another person, whether they're trauma trained or not, it could actually be your primary relationship. It could be your relationship with your parents or your children, your friends, but you need those relationships in order to kind of heal that trauma. So that may mean finding a practitioner. It also might mean finding different people in your life, but we really, really, really need to heal that relational trauma relationally. We cannot do it alone. So I think that, that those two pieces are super important. One is it is events, but it's also how we developed. And two is that we need other people if it is relational. Yeah, I think my daughter had relational trauma. Um, she had a little girl in preschool that for a couple of years was a, a terrible bully to her. I mean, she was just awful to her. And I know it's been traumatic for her because like when she was in play therapy, she would always reenact that that happens. And even when we play at home, there's always a mean girl that's being mean to her. And so she's processing it through this play. So I think that's a really good point. It's not necessarily just an event. Yeah, and I love that you actually took your daughter to play therapy. That's that's really great. I mean, it goes without saying, but the recognition that trauma is going to impact our life is pretty new, all things considered. So I think historically there's always been trauma, but it's really a more modern concept, like within the last 20 years that, ah, this is really, it impacts people's relationships and their finances and their coping strategies and how they interact in the world. And so I love that you were able to recognize that and she was able to do play therapy because I think those interventions are super key. And you can see, because you mentioned that, that 
you know, she did the play therapy and it's still coming out. So it, it takes a while for the body to fully process that. It's not kind of a, let's take, you know, let's go for this one session and away we go. So I, I, I like that you've actually taken that intervention and that we know so much more about it so that we don't have another generation of kids kind of growing up with the <laughs> suppress, repress, it'll all work out, we just be strong. Yeah, and I also try to emphasize in her to let her emotions out no matter what they are, because, you know, I told her if you keep them in, it's just going to make you sick. Like I said, like it made mommy sick and gave me, you know, severe headaches for 20 years when I kept all my emotions in. So let, let's not do that. And she's pretty good about letting her emotions out. She's a, an emotional child. So, yeah. And actually, humans are emotional. And I think that's yeah. where we, we really, again, I know I said that earlier, but we need to really reinforce that and really believe that, that it is not, it is not anti-human. That is the very human condition is we, we know things and we do things. Everything we do is guided by emotions. And that really relates back to those body sensations. If we're living in pain, we can't even access those body sensations. So where can we get more information about you and about what you do? I have a website and social media pages all under the handle My Body Couture. So that is three separate words put together. My, M-Y, Body, B-O-D-Y, Couture, C-O-U-T-U-R-E. And what that really means is that it's customized work for your body. You can send me an email. You can follow my social media pages and you can reach out to me on any of those social media pages with questions, comments, et cetera. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you. I think it's been a, an important topic and a really interesting one for me. I love talking about trauma and modalities. I think that it's, we're only hitting the tip of the iceberg culturally with it. And I think that there's just so much more to be learned about how the body processes trauma, how the body holds trauma and the impact on the nervous system. So I thank you so much for starting to, uh, you know, tackle this super important topic. Yeah, it's a, it's a big one. And make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any health, parenting, or life advice. For my freebie, 30 Ways to Relieve Pain Without Taking a Pill, go to it hurts to mom.com slash tips. If you have comments, suggestions, or want to be on this podcast, email me at it hurts to mom at gmail.com. I wish everybody a blessed and pain-free day. Bye.